October 2nd of 1993, and my husband and I were shopping in the grocery store, picking up a few things. And I was off over picking up some milk or something. My pager went off, and I noticed a long distance number on it. So I says, well, this must be the call. So I ran over and I tried to find Julie. She was on the other end of the supermarket. So I had to search through all these aisles and I finally found her. And he comes running up the aisle, Julie, Julie, my patron went up. It's the Kidney Foundation from San Francisco, it's gotta be. Well, it's easy, it's too soon. No, no, it's And I said, well, I don't think so because it's only been like three months and they told me I had to wait at least six months to two years. This can't be right. What about the shopping? Just leave it, leave it, come on. This is great, this is what we've been looking for. This is our, this the is The minute we got home, I'm running to the answering machine. Julie, this is you. Steve. And I knew it was true. It was like, oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> I was thrilled, I was frightened, and I was in shock all at the same time. It was so soon. But when Julie arrived at the hospital, she realized the full implications of her operation. When I was um, getting ready to have my transplant, I constantly thought um, about my donor, like I wonder what happened, what kind of person this was. I thought about, gosh, you know, another human being has to die for me to live. She was very concerned about that. She felt guilty, and yet she said she was so appreciative of this, you know, being able to get the organs, but she did feel guilty. Although the operation was a success, when Julie got home, she began to notice her personality changing. I remember becoming a little more aggressive, more decisive. Julie, what are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm planting my flowers. In my vegetable garden? Well, now it's my flower garden. End of story. Before the transplant, she really was very shy, and very introverted, and, and was very hesitant to speak her mind. Julie, what's the matter with you? Why are you fighting and being so aggressive with me? That's not like you. Oh, shut up, Jim. She will argue for the sake of arguing. But it wasn't just physical changes, and it wasn't just me um, being more argumentative. I noticed specific things that I started to, to like and really love that I not only didn't like before, but really hated before. In the face, in the face, dad, break, break, go, 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 kill, kill. Julie, when she was growing up, loved frilly dresses or anything that was feminine. She hated sports. She would do anything she could to not watch sports. I was never a tomboy. I never was into any kind of boy things or macho sports. Kill, kill, kill. And she really gets into it. And if I'm sitting on the couch with her, forget it, because at the end of the fight, my, my shoulder's going to be sore. But I like the, the fighting aspect of it and the, the hitting. <laughs> Before she wouldn't even watch it, she wouldn't even look at it. She's got to the point now that she's even uh, memorizing the names of the players on all the teams, the professional teams. She loves it. Go, go. Yeah, yeah, go. yeah, 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 yeah. She knows the rules almost as good as I do. If there's a, a boxing match or football game on, I don't care what you offer me, that's what I want to do instead. Julie was convinced that these changes were in some way connected to her operation, but she didn't know how. Hoping to find out, she agreed to take part in a television program about transplants. Good evening. Final Edition has the exclusive on what must be one of medical science's weirdest phenomenons. With us this evening is Julie Chambra. A brave For the first time, she met her donor's mother. <laughs> when I met Julie on the talk show, it seems that we just clicked like, just like this. I mean, she seems like she's been my friend for, for forever. So, tell us a little about what Dakari was like. Oh, my son, Dakari. I wanted to know, did he like sports? Did he like boxing? Did he like football? He was a very energetic, enthusiastic person. I think she actually cried when I was talking about Dakari. He always did like sports, in particular, boxing and football. My whole body got goosebumps. Just a chill ran through my body. It confirmed 
what I'd been feeling inside, like, oh my gosh, I think the reason that I'm, these changes are happening to me is because of Dakari, because of my donor. Oh my but is there any scientific oh basis God. for this idea? There's this theory called cellular memory, and uh, that is basically the idea that the cells in your body store things, or they, they, they're impacted by what happens to them, and somehow it's stored in the cells. Anything's possible. I mean, there's many things that science doesn't understand, but there's no real scientific mechanism that we would understand yet that could account uh, for how something like, say, a love of football, something like this, could be stored in the kidney or a pancreas. Julie's mother disagrees. I really feel in my heart that there is cell memory. I really do. So many things has changed so drastically since then that can't, you know, there's no other explanation. If you think about the stress involved in a huge operation, in feelings of guilt perhaps, that you're living and somebody else has died, and uh, these things can have really profound effects on how people feel. And I have known patients and even people that I knew sort of privately who'd had transplants who felt very differently, who felt like something else was inside of them. Most transplant recipients go um, through um, serious psychological changes. Now, of course, that's true, you do. But that does not mean that you're specifically going to um, become obsessed with two specific sports. Dr. Rezan also believes the drugs Julie was being prescribed could have reinforced these personality changes. Those medicines can have profound effects on how people think and feel and act. And for instance, in the case of Julie, she went uh, from being more quiet and reserved to being more aggressive, more outgoing. She developed a love of sports. Certainly the aggressive and outgoing is something we see fairly often. I've never heard of a drug or a medication that love, makes women love football and boxing because every man in the world would want to buy these for their wives. When I see her, I see a lot of Dakari in her. Just a little color difference, but other than that, there are just, I mean, one little pea in a pot. <laughs> Our next film reconstructs the events which took place on July the 6th, 1997. For the Daniels family, life was to change forever when they found themselves in one of the most frightening situations imaginable. Shelley Daniels was trapped, knowing she was going to die, and her family was unable to do anything about it. I could feel the water coming in, um, and I couldn't breathe. I had to act and I had to act fast. Most people feel, think that you need open water, deep water to, to drown in. That's not true. You can drown in as, as little as, as two, three inches of water. We were on our way back from uh, a camping and touring vacation. And in the car was my husband James and myself in the front seat. And in the back was my son, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! Okay. Look at that! Oh, wow. Look at that! The car was packed. It's almost a family joke with all the luggage that I have to carry. They say I always come prepared for anything, although they can actually be wrong this time because I wasn't prepared for this one. <laughs> As we rounded the curve, uh, there was a car that was parked in the, in the middle of the road. I was bending over. I had unfastened my seatbelt and was bending over to retrieve something that I had dropped on the floor. As I tried to avoid him, I pulled off the shoulder. My tires caught into this rut, and over we went. I remember getting hit an impact of some sort almost like my body was flung forward i could hear shelly hollering oh my god oh my god you know as we started to fall and it seemed like it was falling really slow your whole being is filled with an instant terror you know that this horrible thing is happening to you and there's nothing that you can do all three of them had been knocked unconscious by the time the car had stopped rolling. 
When I first woke up, I thought that my parents were both dead, and I remember this really stagnant, putrid smell. I thought the car was going to explode because we had just filled up the tank, so I tried to get out of there as quick as I can. I just didn't want to check on them because I didn't want to see the dead bodies, so I just sort of tried to go up there and flag down help. I could smell smoke. The, the car was full of smoke. <coughs> the first thing that I remember was the darkness. There was nothing. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't see anything, and um, I was struggling to move, and I couldn't move. And everything was on top of her. There was just no way that, from where I was sitting at, that I could reach there physically and pull that off of her. So it was like I was in this coffin at the at the bottom of this mountain, <laughs> and I felt the water when it started to come in. And I felt it as it as it came up over my mouth and over my nose. And then I couldn't breathe anymore. I couldn't do anything to get away from the water. I was just trapped under the water in the darkness. The best chance that I had to, uh, to, try, uh, to try to get her out was to maybe go around and hope that I could push the car enough that it would lift her out of the water. Oh, I thought I was going to die. That's why I prayed so hard. I prayed for just one more chance to see my children and my husband. I really thought I was, that that was the end. And um, I didn't want to accept that as the end. Shelly! The terror I felt. Um, the, you know, you're, you're blind with this wild terror. And then all of a sudden, I was calm. The feeling was so strong, it was almost physical. The presence was so strong of my mother that I could physically feel her with every essence of my, of my body. And my mother, she uh, has been deceased since 91. And so to feel her again was something that was really special. She calmed me, she let me know that it was all right. And these strong arms literally picked me up and brought me up from underneath the dashboard from all of this luggage. I didn't have to struggle my way through. The path was almost cleared. It was just I was lifted out. <coughs> Kate! <laughs> I was really amazed to see her get out because of the fact that I had seen how bad she was pinned in. It would have took at least two or three guys to try to get the stuff off her to get her out. There's just no way possible. Although Shelley is convinced that her mother freed her that day, some experts believe there may be another explanation. In this instance, Shelley's instance, she's been knocked unconscious as a result of, of the accident. Uh, as a result of being unconscious, you, you become very relaxed, your muscles go flaccid, and quite often that, that, that will just allow you to just gently fall free. As she's come back up through consciousness, she's probably just gently just eased herself free from the entrapping objects. James is not convinced that Shelley's escape can be so easily explained. Shelley was totally pinned after impact, so to relax at that point enough that she could get out. I, I, I know I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that. But if Shelley had freed herself, why didn't she remember having done so? There are sound physiological explanations which can be given. Her brain suffered trauma sufficient to cause a fracture of the neck. Her blood was carrying less oxygen than normal, and this is essential for normal brain functioning. And finally, almost certainly, her blood pressure would have dropped. All these factors would have produced an abnormal physiological state in the brain, and therefore she would have not have remembered what actually happened at the critical time. She may have filled in these gaps subsequently uh, in the, with the explanation that she has given. This wasn't something that came to me days, weeks, months after the accident. The minute I was out, 
the minute the people had come, I was telling them about this. They asked me, they said, how did you get out? I told them right then, I was lifted out because there was absolutely no way I could have done it on my own. But could the accident itself explain why Shelley had thought of her mother? From a psychological standpoint, when you are facing death, you are often under a great deal of stress, and that causes the brain to release all sorts of chemicals into the bloodstream. And many of these chemicals are anesthetic-like agents, because the brain is anticipating you experiencing pain, and these can perhaps produce a kind of floating-like experience, which is exactly what Shelley experienced at this moment. Also, the brain is discharging itself in all sorts of ways at this moment in time, and that can perhaps produce memories, perhaps from when you were a young child. And it may be that's what Shelley was experiencing, a memory when she was a young child of her mother comforting her, and that might explain the hallucinatory experience she also had. I didn't see anything. I didn't hallucinate anything. I felt it. I felt it. It happened. There wasn't any... Um, great power of my own. Scientists have always got something to say as far as this is how the body works, this is what happens. Well, they have to take in, a, in account they weren't in the accident. They don't know. They don't know the feelings that you have. Our next story began in October 1944 in Budapest. Hundreds of Jews were being forced onto a train destined for Auschwitz. Suddenly, a man started handing out Swedish passports and demanding that everyone be released. He ignored the soldiers' warnings even when they opened fire. That man was Raoul Wallenberg, and as millions were murdered during the Nazi Holocaust, he managed to save over 100,000 lives in the ghettos of Budapest. More people even than Oskar Schindler. But at the end of the war, he vanished, and to this day, no one knows what happened to him. Raoul was born in 1912, the eldest son of wealthy Swedish aristocrats. And although he could have spent the war in safety, he was horrified by stories of the Nazi Holocaust. Using his diplomatic cover, he left for Budapest. On his way to Budapest, he came to see us, and uh, uh, he told about his mission, and we understood how dangerous it was, and nothing could have stopped him. He seemed so full of expectation to be able to help these people who were really in great trouble. When Raoul arrived in Budapest, he discovered conditions for the Jews were appalling. They were forced to live in a ghetto before being transported to the death camps. It was a terrible sight in the streets dead horses, dead people, and you know, there was, there was chaos. German soldiers were watching, and they could do whatever they liked. Wallenberg's plan was simple. Sweden was neutral, and its citizens protected. So if he could give the Jews Swedish nationality, they should be safe as well. He uh, invented uh, what we called the Schutzpass, the protective passport. It was in the Swedish colors and with Swedish coat of arms on. Quite an impressive document. But uh, the Nazis who were illiterate and uh, not very knowledgeable about documents, they were very often impressed by these stamps and all that. It was a complete bluff, the whole thing. The bluff worked and Wallenberg set up houses for the Jews to live in. But even then, they weren't completely safe from the Nazis. One night, German SS people came in. Baus, schnell, schnell. Then Raoul Wallenberg came and ordered the German 
to stop. He showed the passport and told them that these are Swedish citizens and I demand them back. I really thought that he was protected, he was an angel, he was sent to us from, from God. Wallenberg carried on until 1945 when Russian troops stormed Budapest. On liberating the ghetto, they found 97,000 Jews still alive and one Swedish diplomat. And it's here that the mystery really begins because on the 17th of January 1945, Raoul Wallenberg disappeared without trace. The only thing known for sure is that he was escorted from Budapest by Russian troops. As he left, he said to a friend he didn't know if he was going as their guest or their prisoner. It was the last time he was seen. Ever since, there has been theory and counter-theory about why the Russians took Wallenberg. Could he have been working for the Nazis as a spy? Of course, he had to, to negotiate with them for the relief work. He had made notes, many notes, about his different meetings with the Nazis. And that must be a, a pretext for something else. And uh, he might be a spy for the Germans. But it wasn't only the Nazis Wallenberg could have been spying for. We don't know exactly why Mr. Wallenberg was arrested by the Russians, but one reason could have been that uh, the Russians knew that his activities in Budapest were financed by American money, and um, they suspected that he was an American spy. But what happened to him after the Russians took him still remains a mystery. For two years, the Russians admitted they had Wallenberg, but then the story took a more sinister turn, because in 1947, they announced that Wallenberg had never been their prisoner. They claimed that he'd been murdered either by the Germans or their sympathizers immediately after the war. His family, however, was not convinced that this new story was true. When the, the Russians told us that Gold had perhaps been murdered in Budapest, we didn't believe it because we had already had many Italian and German prisoners coming back from prison in Moscow, and they had been together with Gold in prison. For 10 years, the Russians claimed they didn't have Wallenberg, but in 1957, they changed their story. In fact, he had been taken back to Russia, but they claimed he had died of a heart attack in prison. To prove it, they produced a doctor's note, but not everyone believes that is authentic. The Russians had to deliver something after so many questions by the Swedish government, but I never believed in the note by this prison doctor because he wrote his own name on the same paper uh, differently. There were experts examining this letter and they said, okay, yes, it is strange. And in my opinion, the doctor's note was a cover up because <coughs> Raoul at that time was far too young to die by a heart attack. Years passed with stories of Wallenberg's survival leaking out. Then in 1989, President Gorbachev invited Raoul's family to Russia. 44 years after he disappeared, they thought they would finally get the truth. We had great hopes to get Raoul back. Instead of Raoul, we got a box full of uh, Raoul's papers. But although Gorbachev stuck to the story that Wallenberg had died years before, his family is still not convinced. We have to go on for Raoul's sake to find the truth, what has happened to him. Many are sure this truth lies buried in Russian archives. You can't hide for eternity what happened to a man like Wallenberg who has become a symbol for, for the fight for human rights. For the whole world is interested to know what happened to him. Although no one knows whether Raoul Wallenberg is alive or dead, one thing is certain, he will never be forgotten. He saved so many people and uh, nobody helped him really. And I think it is very important that the story be told and found out what happened to him. But we need the truth.
That's all for this week. On our next program, how was a man's murder solved before anyone knew he was dead? Does an ancient map hold the key to a lost civilization? And what saved this woman's life after doctors have pronounced her dead? Until then, from Mysteries, goodbye. Next week's programme's at the same time, 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. Next tonight on BBC One, Celta Vigo v Liverpool in the UEFA Cup is the match of the day live. This month, Hurricane Mitch destroyed five million homes, while the UK suffered the worst floods for years. And the forecasts say this is only the beginning. It's like the ocean coming. How do we survive when trapped by extreme weather? 999 reports. Storm alert, tomorrow at 9.30 on BBC One. There's a lot of sauce on BBC Two in a minute when Delia demonstrates flower power. It's Christmas Eve in Val d'Isère. And the Shally girls are up for it. Let's get out of <laughs> But for Ski Bum Scott and Fraser, <laughs> it's downhill all the way. Look at the little empty bed. Some f sneaked our car. War and Peace, tomorrow at 10.15 on BBC One. Looking back, right, you've got to laugh at some of the gear I was wearing. From humble beginnings. When I was a kid, I was the kind of lad I was sort of the kind of lad my mum didn't want me to play with. So his big break in television. The producer put together me and a man I've grown to love, the great JV. I'm not saying he's wooden, but he uses furniture polish for makeup. He's inspired generations. The great old institution that's been running for almost 30 years, longer than our marriage is put together. Jim Davidson so far, Friday 10.20 on BBC One. This is a show all about me. BBC One Match of the Day, live with Desmond Lynham.